Welcome to episode 160 of Eco Ask Why. We have an exciting episode today. I'm going to be chatting with Daniel Harrington about electrochemical machining and the impact it can have on manufacturing. Before we get started, we need a little help from you, the listener. Send us your industry war stories. We want the good, the tough, and the inspiring. Send us a short clip or write in to have your story featured on an upcoming episode. Don't forget, you can keep those stories generic and exclude those company names and personal bias. Submissions can be sent via a direct message on Instagram or on Facebook, and you can find the links in the show notes. I really look forward to hearing the stories from all facets of industry. And with that, it's time to learn about a new concept on Eco Ask Why from the expert himself, Daniel Harrington. Cue the music. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we're going to be talking about a brand new topic for us. What is pulse electrochemical machining? And to have us walk through this topic, I have with us Daniel Harrington, who is the CEO at Voxel Innovation. So welcome, Daniel. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Chris. How you doing today, man? Great. Uh, another good day in Raleigh, North Carolina. That's right. That's right. Daniel and I, for our listeners, we were actually able to meet. I was able to go to his shop, uh, see some of the cool things they're doing. It was uh, just a great time for me to get out there and, and meet him and had to introduce had to invite him on the podcast he graciously accepted so excited for this again it's a brand new topic so daniel get us get our listeners up to speed man when, when you're talking about pulsed electrochemical machining what exactly is that yeah so it, it's really a derivation of electrochemical machining and electrochemical machining as a process has been around for a long uh, a pretty good time maybe since the 60s here in the u.s okay but at the very basics, what we're doing is we're dissolving metal. And the way we do that is we use a conductive tool as an electrode. It's roughly the inverse of the part we're trying to make. We move that close to the workpiece. And in between the two, we have a conductive saltwater solution. And then we apply a voltage potential or a current potential. And that current plus the salt water, that conductive solution, and those two metal electrodes are a tool in the workpiece. Mm -hmm basically sets up a, a corrosion cell. So in effect, what we're doing is corroding the material, but doing it very quickly. Uh, so we can, our tool uh, sort of realizes a roughly inverse shape into the workpiece. Mm -hmm. uh, so much in the same way that you think of a, a stamping operation or sinker EDM operation, you know, it's sort of like stamping without the contact or sinker EDM without the sparks. Uh, right. Uh, so similar to those processes in a, a couple different ways. Yeah. I'm thinking through our listeners who may be thinking in that traditional machining world where, where you're cutting parts away. So there's, there's no actual contact here. Yeah, no contact. You know, it, it is a subtractive process uh, like machining is, but mm -hmm. we aren't forming chips. We are literally dissolving the material atom by atom. And wow. Uh, that's that's part of the genesis of our name as well. You know, voxel is a 3D pixel, and it to some extent embodies the fact that we're removing a voxel at a time. You know, a very small unit of material with every okay. pulse of energy. Now that's very cool. Okay, so we made the tie to the to the company brand right there. That's awesome. That's right. Very cool. So, you know, I think you mentioned that it the the, the it originated with the electrochemical machining. So maybe the, the pulse part, how long has that process been around and, and what, what was the origin there? Yeah, so electrochemical machining, um, the, the power that I talked about, you apply the electrical potential to the process. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, an ECM has just been a continuous current or continuous voltage. Okay. So you'd start the process, you get the electrode moving towards the workpiece, you turn the power on, and it, it sits there and runs. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty good for bulk material removal and roughing applications. And, um, and there are many people that have used that in the past, uh, successfully, but if you want to get good resolution now, the process, the distance between your electrode and your workpiece, uh, so that's your tool and the workpiece needs to be very small. And by small, I mean, uh, one or two thou, uh, wow. yeah, so 25 to 50 micrometers. And, at a gap that small, uh, it's critical in this process to remove the waste products that you create to the flush between those that tool and workpiece. Mm -hmm. And with a one thou gap or 25 micrometer gap, it's really hard to flush those waste products. And so the pulse process 
uh, can do a couple things. One, you can apply a duty cycle to that power supply. So instead of a continuous current or continuous voltage, you apply pulses of voltage or current. And that slows the process down. You've now got a duty cycle. But those waste products, uh, it gives you time for those waste products to be removed from the gap. Uh, so that, that's one pulsed technique that we apply. Uh, another is to vibrate the axis. So in many cases, we're doing a single sinking axis operation. So our electrode sort of has three axes of complexity built into it, like a, an ADM electrode might, and we sink that into the part. Uh, but we will flush the electro, electrode by vibrating it up and down. And that we can dynamically change the gap from 25 micrometers up to 500 micrometers or a millimeter or something like that. And that's another way to enable us to flush waste product uh, or the waste in and out of that, that gap. Uh, so really the pulse process is just a way to get more resolution out of the machining operation. Uh, and we can get um, better uh, service finish as well. We can run a higher current density as we get even more polished surfaces in our process. So right. it's got a number of advantages. Um, but by and large, we're really just expanding the tool sets we've got with electrochemical machining. So pulsed and vibration and other sort of patent pending techniques we've developed are all just ways to make the process better, more efficient, okay. and suit a, a wider market. You probably have a lot of listeners thinking when you're saying pulsed and electrical, what types of voltages and currents are we talking about here? I'm just I'm just curious on the bandwidth of, of what you're sure. working with. Sure. So we're typically a low voltage, high amperage process. And okay. so we might run five to 50 volts in our process, but we're running hundreds to thousands of amps. Ooh. And okay. uh, so it gets... Uh, the power supplies get big in a hurry. Yeah, yeah. And if you're working on big parts, you need a lot of power. Um, and the way to think about this is that if you have a surface, you know, say you've got a flat plate and you're trying to machine a, an area on that flat plate, the bigger the surface area, the more current we need to uh, machine all that area continuously. Right. So you, you could do one area of it, move the electrode over, do another area, and, and, and that way utilize less peak current. But a real sort of advantage that our process has above many other techniques is that if we make a part that is twice as large, we do need twice the amperage, but we still go at the same feed rate. So you are effectively doubling your throughput. Oh. Um, so it's a big advantage for us to be able to utilize larger surfaces or, or in some cases, multiple parts together in parallel. You can get a, a big speed boost out of the process doing it that way. And that's in stark contrast to many conventional machining operations or EDM operations, you know, you need multiple spindles on a CNC machining operation to get that same comparative throughput advantage that we get in our process. Right. Right. And I'm curious too, like for, for this, for this technology, is there a particular industry that aligns better for the, the output, you know, what you're, what you're producing? Yeah. So when we started the company, we knew this process had value that it had been used in a couple of niche applications in the past, mm -hmm. but honestly, we weren't sure all the different areas that would be a good fit for it. Um, and so we started by just focusing on those applications that had hard to machine materials and mm -hmm. tight tolerances. And, and honestly, those material, those applications were, they'd have sort of a, an engineering cost trade-off. So okay. applications where, they might pay more for a better performing part rather than just chasing the cheapest part possible, you know? Uh, and so those are typically engineering heavy, heavy applications. And we find those commonly in aerospace, medical, some energy applications. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's been our focus is really on those aerospace, medical energy applications. But since we started, and especially over the last year or two, we found people in industries and applications that I've never heard of. And that's kind of the point of that's fun. getting our name out there and explaining the technology is that you start learning about all these different things you didn't even know existed uh, right. and could benefit from our technology. Now, is it, is it do you find it, it that the solution aligns better when you have batches of product to make where it's repetitive or is it a one-off type 
you know, scenario yeah. two? Yeah, good question. It is not a one-off okay. process, um, at least not yet. Maybe in some future iteration, uh, we'll figure out how to get there. But the best use of this process is in volume production. Okay. Um, and, you know, if you're making a complex turbine engine component or something, you know, maybe you could make tens of them a year and, and be competitive. But if you're making a smaller medical device, uh, some disposable or reusable component, you know, you better be in the sort of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands, even millions of parts. Right. And that's where the process really shines. It, it's advantage really comes through when you get to volume production. Right, right. I mean, how, when you talk about this, this pulse electrochemical machining world, how big is it? How many people are out there doing this type of work, Daniel? It, it's small. Uh, I think I have interacted with a lot of them in this space. It, it's fairly uh, small, especially in the U.S. So right. when I first started the business, I noticed that there was greater adoption and uptake and practitioners of this process in Europe. Oh. But the U.S. market really lagged behind them, um, even though in some ways we were pioneers in the 60s of electrochemical machining. This pulse process, uh, to some extent, originated out of Europe, um, particularly out of uh, Philips. Uh, they make the electric razor caps for their yeah. uh, electric shaver uh, in, in the Netherlands with this technology. And so they did a lot of work and innovation around the technology in the late 90s. Uh, and then we started seeing a few other people take up the practice in the mid 2000s, but predominantly in Europe. And the US has been very slow to adopt. And uh, that's probably for a few reasons, you know, partly just due to education about what the processes and how it works. There's also some bad stigma around electrochemical machine in the past that people that have used it here didn't manage the waste correctly or they found challenges with it and uh, sort of uh, abandoned it in favor of CNC machining, uh, particularly as that technology evolved. Right. Uh, so that's meant that in the U.S. there's been a, a very few people here that work on the process and, you know, less than 10 companies, I'd say, that are doing anything with electrochemical machining full stop. And then uh, maybe half of that are working on the pulse process. And almost all of those are uh, sort of focused on buying equipment from a European vendor. Uh, so they're not really focused on this as their core business. Uh, so that's how we are a little bit different here in the US market. It's really trying to focus entirely on this electrochemical machine process, uh, not only running it as contract manufacturers, but developing innovations, filing patents, developing right. new technology that really pushes the state of the art forward here in the U.S. That's really, that's really cool. Now, how long have you been uh, there at, at Voxel? Uh, so started about five years ago, and it was uh, literally me in a garage. Okay. <laughs> Love, um, it. Love that story. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, wasn't my garage. I rented a garage, but it was still small. It was, <laughs> you know, 800 square feet and, um, uh, when I started, you know, there are machines, especially in Europe, to do electrochemical machining, but uh, so they can be pretty expensive. I didn't have the cash to buy one of those. Yeah. So, so I built my own machine from scratch uh, here in that 800 square foot shop. And um, at some point hired uh, a first engineer to really help me with that process and probably spent a year and a half, um, you know, if you count the value of our time, I'm sure we spent more than it would have cost to go buy a piece of equipment, right, but that, right. that's invaluable. You know, we yeah. learned a lot about the technology, how it works, what matters. Uh, and now we're in a position where we can either continue to build our own equipment or we can go spec equipment that we know uh, will work to our needs. Uh, so absolutely, that's been the right way to go in our, our mind. But in you know, that first year or two was really the blind leading the blind you know? yeah probably a lot of uh, a lot of energy drinks being consumed right Just... <laughs> energy drinks late nights uh google was our biggest resource for trying to understand what we're doing you know this is a a very multidisciplinary technology yeah. so i'm a mechanical engineer by training but uh, i know a lot more about electrochemistry and chemistry than i ever thought i would uh <laughs> you know, six years ago i'd say <laughs> now, i know people may be thinking in their mind of like a, just a typical CNC machine when they walk through and they see a, a pulse electrochemical machine at work, 
Is it similar in the type setup and the look and the aesthetics? I mean, just try to paint that visual for the, for a listener yeah. who may be new to it. It's it's similar. It's it's probably more similar to a sinker EDM operation if people run across it. Um, uh, you know, the big difference between us and a CNC machine you know, out from the outside they look pretty similar, but the inside you know, don't have a big spindle, so we don't have a big motor and have to deal with that. Right. We don't have to move as fast as the CNC, so you know, having high pitch ball screws and stuff to move quickly is not important for us. Um, but the biggest difference is we need our work environment to be sealed uh, and we're running in a saltwater solution. So if you just put cast iron or steel in there, it will rust in a few days <laughs> right. and become unusable in a week. So um, all of our enclosures are uh, stainless or plastic or uh, some mix of the two, some composites. Uh, and we need to make sure to manage that electrolyte system pretty well. And so, you know, that's kind of the other big piece that's different from a CNC machine is we have a whole waste treatment system. And it is literally looks like a, a small uh, municipal wastewater treatment plant, but really? tailored specifically to our application. And so, a CNC machine really can get away with just a, a coolant tank and a pump um, yeah. and, and sort of a, maybe some filtration on that coolant to pull the chips out. Ours, uh, we've got multiple couple hundred gallon tanks and metering pumps and filtration systems all to take that electrolyte, clean it of the dissolved metal and recycle it back into the process. And yeah. so that's, uh, you know, that's as big as the, the ECM or PECM machine. That sounds really cool. And I tell you, for our listeners, we'll have that link in our uh, show notes as well. So you can go check out Vox on I think you got some pictures, if I remember correctly, on your website to give that visual a little bit more. Yeah, there should be some pictures on our website of that. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm curious, you know, five years you've been doing this. I'm sure you've learned a lot. I'm sure there have been some headwinds as well. When you try to explain this technology to, to, to other people, um, where, where do you find that that friction point at to maybe you have to get past CNC versus now electrochemical machining. I mean, what, what's been the way you've, you've been able to combat that? Yeah. Uh, it's constantly a challenge. I, I think when you can put, uh, show them, demonstrate what the result is and mm -hmm. put it in their hands, right. that's the first bar barrier you have to overcome. I mean, well, I should take that back. Really the first one is just some education, you know, get them comfortable with the fact how this process works you know we take a very engineering heavy approach with these conversations so mm -hmm. that, that's on, on purpose we want people to understand what it is feel confident that we understand the fundamentals that are happening here in this process and if right. you don't understand that it's hard to really certainly innovate but really practice the technology well um and second is to try and make some prototype or sample part or, you know, see it in action. Um, that's honestly where the first sticking point comes because I already described how this process is not great for prototyping. And so someone says, Hey, you know, here's our, our part. Can you make a, a first attempt at it? You know, make us a sample of it. And can you do it for a thousand dollars? I say, no way, you know, right. Uh, we need, $10,000 or $50,000, you know, it depends on the application to, to really make a good first attempt. And uh, it may require a little bit more iteration from there and takes us, you know, eight or 10 weeks to do it. So it's right. not so straightforward there. So that's sort of the second barrier. Um, and then the third one is just figuring out, getting them comfortable with where the ECM operation is going to happen. You know, we are mostly focused on providing a contract manufacturing service okay. so that they don't have to understand how to handle the waste treatment system and how to make sure the process runs consistently and keep up with the maintenance and all that sort of stuff. You know, that's, that's our responsibility. And I think in most cases, that's a good solution, but there are companies that they're making 5 million parts a year of some widget and it's right next to some other line. And so they really want that in their facility. Mm. And, and that's another bigger barrier that we are just starting to really address with some of these customers is uh, building a turnkey system and getting them comfortable with what that entails and the waste stream that comes off the machine and how you manage it, what the maintenance cycles look like. 
Right. Uh, that's really sort of the next evolution of our company is, is helping enable some of those turnkey operations for some of our customers uh, when necessary. That sounds exciting. Now, when you think about the people who are actually operating these machines, where would they need to be going to spend time to learn to, to what resources should they start, you know, evaluating? Cause I'm sure, you know, the skills gap for just operating one of these, it may be extremely high. I don't know. So, I mean, where would you point people or give advice if they want to get into this industry and start walking that road? Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure I even know the answer to that question today. Okay. You know, the, the hard part has been, well, I'd say the people we've got employed here have been a mix of engineers and tool and die machinists okay. and, you know, CNC operators, um, could, be taught how to make this work, but no one really comes off is out there with ECM experience. Uh, you know, those are few and far between. And you know, the tool and guy die people are uh, have the right sort of mindset because they're thinking about what's happening in the process and how can I make this better, more efficient. Even if they know nothing about ECM and how it works, right. they at least have the concept for tolerances and fix fixturing components and and sort of keeping an eye on the process, uh, consistency and repeatability. So they've got that kind of mindset. You know, I think people that have experienced Synchro EDM, especially Synchro EDM in a production environment, mm -hmm. they're probably familiar with lots of the same um, phenomena that happen in the process. You know, it's a completely different mechanism, but similar in, in many ways, uh, more similar than they are different. Um, but the rest of that is really just training, you know, um, we also are, because we're doing more focus on uh, production applications rather than job shop or one-off applications, it means that we consider and think a lot about automating this process, um, okay. trying to make it simple so that, you know, maybe an operator could be running a couple machines or it's all robotically loaded and, and run lights out. And, you know, that's kind of the the route we want to be heading, but, um, uh, yeah, we, we also deal with tight tolerance things. So if, if you're used to plus or minus five thou, uh, that's not our world. Yeah. It doesn't you know, work in this world. Yeah. Yeah. We're routinely talking about sub thou tolerances on lots of our components and that's just the nature of the applications and customers we're dealing with. You know, people don't come to us with easy problems. Uh, right. They come to us with the hard stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's been exciting to learn about this technology. And Daniel, we call it the show Eco Ask Why. And I always save the why towards the end. So if, if that for love to, to get your, your answer here on why does this Pulse Electrochemical Machining Solution, why should that be considered as industries start evaluating these technologies in the future? Yeah, good question. So there are, are really three value propositions to the technology that I want okay. to make sure people are aware of. So uh, first is the high quality surface finish we get. So um, we run a process that has very similar, um, a similar material removal mechanism as electro polishing. So we are often getting mirror like surfaces or at least very good quality surfaces out of our process. Uh, second, the, the process is uh, very low stress. So even EDM, which is a non-contact process and laser cutting processes, you know, they're non-contact, but they still use thermal mechanisms to remove the material, ablation or something along those lines. Um, certainly CNC machining cuts the material. So it, right. it can induce a lot of stress in the process. Our removal mechanism is very clean. It produces very low heat in the environment. You know, you're gonna be well below uh, boiling temperature of water, and you know, we have to be because our solution is aqueous, and uh, we don't induce any stress in the material. We're not touching it. We're not putting any heat into the process. So that means not only do we get surfaces that are high quality, they don't have recast layer or heat affected zone. We don't get any burrs on these parts either, so you don't have to go any do any secondary uh, finishing operation, and we can produce very thin walled features. You know we. Uh, produce features that are a couple thou wide and, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 to one aspect ratios without too much issue. Uh, we've also done some work recently on creating slots that are 400 microliters wide 
and they're blind and they go five millimeters deep. Uh, so these are, we've got some interesting capability here because of that low stress environment. Yeah. And then third and lastly is the speed of the process. And, okay. you know, this always comes with the asterisks. It kind of depends on what we're discussing here, but the areas where our process is faster than others are first, if you've got a really challenging material. So mm -hmm. we just care about the chemistry of the material, not its hardness or toughness. So we can machine a single crystal uh, nickel super alloy that's in a jet engine about as fast as we can machine aluminum or copper. You know, that the difference in those materials really doesn't affect us. Um, there are some other chemistry reasons we might care about the material, uh, but generally it's pretty flexible and fast across a lot of different materials. So we find that those harder machine materials are a good fit for us. And then second, the other sort of speed advantage we have, we discussed briefly earlier, is the fact that we can do multiple features simultaneously or multiple parts in parallel to get this throughput of the process up. Uh, right. So uh, particularly when you're talking about doing tens or hundreds of thousands or millions of parts a year, you know, that's critical to making the, the parts affordable enough uh, for volume production. So it's really those three benefits that I think people should be aware of. Those, uh, the high quality surfaces, the low stress, so you can produce thin walled features and delicate features and the speed of the process, particularly for hard to machine materials or higher volumes of parts are all what set us apart. Um, but the process is hard. You know, I, I want to make sure people yeah. are aware that this is not just a, 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 an easy process. If it was, you'd find a lot more people doing it. Um, and uh, so it requires more money and time up front to figure those parameters out and get right. those benefits to deliver. But that's something we're working on. We're trying to reduce those barriers so we can offer the service for cheaper and for more industries. Right. <clears throat> Well, man, this has been a, a, a fabulous episode of being able to learn about this technology. Daniel, thank you for sharing your wisdom and insight with our listeners. For those that want to check out and, and, and connect with you directly to learn more about Voxel, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, so uh, you can go to our website, which is voxelinnovations.com. Okay. Voxel is V-O-X-E-L. And uh, there's a, a lot of good content on that website, actually, that will help you learn. In particular, our blog posts, we've put a lot of effort into trying to educate yeah. uh, website visitors about what the process does well and what it doesn't and how you can apply it. And then, you know, if you want to reach out to me, there's uh, an info at voxelinnovations.com website you, or email address you can use. There's also a form on our website. And that will come really straight to me. So okay. uh, that'd be a, a fast and easy way to get in touch with me or learn a little bit more about what we do. Very good. Very good. We'll make sure for our listeners that those are, those links are in our show notes. And Daniel, thank you again for taking the time with us today. We really enjoyed this. It was exciting. Love uh, breaking new, new, new ground here on Eco SY. So you're doing great things there in Raleigh. And we hope to support you in the future. And just thank you again for sharing what you did today. Great. Thank you, Chris. I enjoyed it. Yes, sir. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S. -S 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 -S